Heracles. Proudly did the Muses sing of Heracles, often called Hercules, the strongest man who ever lived on earth and the greatest of all the descendants of Danaus. His mother was Princess Alcmena, granddaughter of Perseus and Andromeda, and famed for her beauty and virtue. His father was Zeus, so Hera, of course, hated Alcmena and pursued Heracles with her wrath. When he was an infant, the goddess sent two spotted serpents into his cradle, but little Heracles simply grasped them in his powerful hands and squeezed the life out of them. He grew stronger every day, but his trouble was that he did not know his own strength. Being of noble birth, he had to learn to sing and play the lyre, but Heracles would much rather wrestle and fight. One day his music teacher Linus scolded him for singing out of tune. In a fit of fury, Heracles banged his lyre over the teacher's head, harder than he had meant, and the blow killed the poor man. Heracles was too strong to have around a palace, so he was sent into the mountains as a shepherd. There he could use his tremendous strength on prowling beasts. Soon he had rid the countryside around Thebes of lions and wolves, and the fame of his strength spread far and wide. He came back from the mountains as a hero and the king of Thebes regarded him so highly that he gave him his daughter in marriage. Hera did not like this at all, and she made Heracles insane. Raving mad, he swatted down his own children, mistaking them for wild beasts. When he regained his senses, he was horrified at what he had done, and went to the oracle of Delphi to learn what he must do to atone for his crime. He was told that he must serve for ten years as the slave of his cousin Eurystheus, and perform ten labors for him. Hera was pleased, for Eurystheus, the king of Mycenae, was a weak little man who hated his strong cousin Heracles. With her help, the king would surely think of the hardest tasks for Heracles to perform. For his first four labors, Eurystheus sent Heracles to rid the nearby countryside of dangerous beasts and monsters. In the valley of Nemea dwelt a monstrous lion whose hide was so tough it could not be pierced by any weapons. It was one of Echidna's dreadful offspring, which Zeus had let live as a challenge to future heroes. Heracles chased it out of its lair, seized it in his bare hands, and squeezed it to death. Then he skinned the beast with its own claws, and with the impenetrable skin of the Nemean lion slung over his head and shoulders, he reported back to Eurystheus, his first labor performed. In the swamps of Lerna there lived a nine-headed hydra, another of Echidna's brood. This monster was so poisonous that the fumes from its breath alone were enough to kill whatever came close to it. Heracles filled his enormous lungs with air, held his breath, and ran at the hydra. Swinging his club, he knocked off its heads, and one after the other they rolled to the ground. But no sooner had he knocked off one head than a new one grew in its place. He half turned around and let out enough air to call to his charioteer to bring a firebrand and sear the necks. Then no new heads could sprout. When Hera saw that Heracles was winning over the hydra, she sent a giant crab to pinch his heel. With a mighty kick, Heracles sent the giant crab flying as he knocked off the last of the heads. Then he dipped his arrows in the hydra's blood, making them so poisonous that a mere scratch from them was deadly, and he returned to Mycenae, his second labor performed. On the slopes of Mount Erymanthus roamed a wild and dreadful boar, with tusks as sharp as swords. Eurystheus sent Heracles to bring this beast back alive. With loud yells, Heracles chased the boar out of its lair and drove it ahead of him all the way to the top of the snow-capped mountain. The heavy beast sank into the snow, and it was easy for Heracles to catch and subdue it. He pushed, dragged, and rolled it all the way down to the gates of Mycenae. When Eurystheus saw the fearful boar, he dived into an urn and barely dared to peek out. Then Eurystheus sent Heracles to rid the Stymphalian lake of a swarm of dangerous birds. They had feathers of brass so sharp that when one of them fell to the ground, it killed whomever it hit. But they could not penetrate Heracles' lion skin, and he made such a din with a huge rattle that the birds took fright and flew away never to return. Eurystheus was distressed to see with what great ease Heracles had performed his first four labors. Now he sent him to bring back alive one of the sacred hinds of Artemis. He hoped that Heracles would harm the creature with his brute strength and thereby earn the wrath of the goddess. But Heracles pursued the swift deer with great patience over hills and dales. The year was almost over when at last he caught the deer. With great care he carried it back to Mycenae. 
Next, to humble his strong cousin, Eurystheus ordered Heracles to clean the stables of King Ogeus, who lived across the mountains to the west. King Ogeus had huge herds, and his stables and barnyards had not been cleaned for years. Heaps of dung rose mountain high. No man alive could clean his stables in a year, thought Eurystheus. But Heracles, with tremendous strength, changed the course of two rivers. The waters flowed through stables and barnyards and washed them clean in less than a day. Eurystheus now, on the advice of Hera, sent Heracles far afield for his last four labors. He must travel way to the east and fetched back to Mycenae the golden girdle of Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons. The Amazons were a tribe of wild and warlike women who rode better and fought harder than any men. Eurystheus was sure that even Heracles would be overwhelmed by the furious women. But when Heracles arrived in Amazon land, the proud queen was so taken by the sight of his bulging muscles that she gave him her belt without a fight. She would gladly have given him her hand in the bargain. But Hera, in the disguise of an Amazon, spread the rumor that Heracles had come to kidnap Hippolyta. The Amazons threw themselves upon Heracles, but for once they had found their master. Heracles swung his mighty club, and the little Amazon husbands, who were spinning and cooking and tending the babies, were amazed to see their dangerous wives subdued by a single man. In triumph, Heracles returned to Mycenae with the Hippolyta's belt. He could not bring the queen. She had been killed in the fight. Far to the north there lived a king whose name was Diomedes. He was a very inhospitable king, and had trained his four mares to devour all strangers who came to his land. Now Eurystheus sent Heracles to capture the four man-eating mares and bring them back alive. Heracles traveled to the north, slew King Diomedes, and threw him to his own mares. When the mares had eaten the evil king, they were so tame that they let Heracles drive them back to the gates of Mycenae. Then Eurystheus sent Heracles south to catch a fierce, fire-breathing bull on the island of Crete. The Cretans, who were great bullfighters, could not catch the bull, but Heracles seized the charging bull by the horns without heeding the flames from its nostrils, flung it to the ground, and returned to Mycenae, bringing the subdued beast. Eurystheus was glad he had a safe urn to hide in. For his tenth labor, Heracles was sent to an island far out in the ocean to bring back a huge herd of red cows. They belonged to Gerion, a monster with three bodies on one pair of legs. Heracles walked off with a powerful stride and soon reached the end of all land in the west. The only boat he could spot was the golden vessel of Helios, the sun. Heracles aimed his mighty bow at the sun and threatened to shoot him from the sky if he did not lend it to him. Helios did not dare to refuse, and he let Heracles take his golden boat. Before he sailed off, Heracles pulled up two huge crags and sent them down, one on each side of the strait that separates Europe from Africa. There they stand to this day, called the Pillars of Hercules. When Heracles was out at sea and the waves rose high around him, he aimed a poisoned arrow at the waves, threatening to shoot them if they did not still at once. The waves flattened in fear and Heracles sailed on to Gerion's island. He began at once to load the herd of red cows, and Gerion's watchman and his two-headed dog rushed at him. With one swing of his mighty club, Heracles did away with them both. Then Gerion himself came running to attack him. His three huge bodies swayed on his thin legs. Calmly, Heracles lifted his bow, took careful aim, and sent a poisoned arrow through all of the monster's three bodies. As time was getting short, Heracles rode back as fast as he could with the herd. When he arrived at the mainland, Hera sent a swarm of gadflies to sting the cows, and they scattered all over Europe. Still, Heracles managed to round them up and bring them to the gates of Mycenae just before the year was up. There, Eurystheus sacrificed the cows to Hera, and gratified, the goddess whispered into his ear that he must demand two more labors from Heracles, for his charioteer had helped him to singe the heads of the hydra, and not he but the waters of two rivers had washed the Augean stables clean. Heracles scowled, but he bowed his head in submission, for he had won much glory on his ten labors and hoped to win some more. For his eleventh labor, Heracles was sent to find Hera's secret garden of the Hesperides and pick three golden apples from the little apple tree that Mother Earth had given Hera for her wedding gift. Nereus, the old gray man of the sea, was the only one on earth who knew where the garden was, but he would not reveal the secret. When Heracles seized him to squeeze the secret out of him, Nereus tried to escape by changing himself into all kinds of animals. But Heracles held on to him, and at last Nereus had to tell him that the Garden of the Hesperides lay west of the setting sun, not far from where the Titan Atlas stood, holding up the sky. 
On his way to the garden, Heracles heard the groans of the titan Prometheus, who was changed to the Caucasus Mountains. Heracles was in a hurry, but he felt sorry for the titan and took time off to tear apart his chains. Zeus, impressed by the strength of his son, let him do it. In gratitude, Prometheus warmed to Heracles not to pick the golden apples himself or he would die. They were apples of immortality and could be picked only by a god. Heracles traveled over land and over sea, and at last he came to the garden of the Hesperides. Nearby stood the titan Atlas, and Heracles offered to hold up the sky for him if he would pick three golden apples from Hera's tree. Atlas said he would be glad to be rid of his heavy burden for a while, but he feared the dragon Laden, which lay under the tree watching it with all the eyes of his hundred heads. A hundred-headed dragon could not frighten Heracles. He drew his bow and shot it. Then he took the sky on his shoulders, and Atlas reached out and picked the apples. The three little nymphs who tended the tree wept bitter tears, but they could not stop Atlas, now that the watchful dragon was dead. Heracles' knees started to buckle, so heavy with the weight of the sky, but Atlas stretched himself, enjoying his freedom. I might as well take these apples to Eurystheus myself, said the titan, and started to walk away. Heracles well understood that Atlas had no intention of ever coming back, but he pretended to agree. Very well, he said. Just hold the sky while I make a pad of my lion's skin. The sky is hard on my shoulders. This sounded reasonable to Atlas. He put down the golden apples and braced himself against the vault of the sky. Thank you for picking the apples, said Heracles, and hurried homeward. On his way to Mycenae, Heracles was stopped by the giant wrestler Antaeus. He lived in a hut beside the road and forced all travelers to wrestle with him. He was a son of Mother Earth and could not die as long as he touched her, so he always won and had built his hut of the skulls and bones of his victims. When Heracles threw the giant to the ground, thinking he was dead, but saw him spring up revived, he understood what was happening. Seizing Antaeus, he held him in the air until he had squeezed all life out of him. Heracles hurried on to Mycenae and gave the golden apples to Eurystheus. But Eurystheus did not dare to keep them. He gave them to Athena, who took them back to Hera's garden, where they belonged. For his twelfth labor, Heracles had to go to the underworld, capture Cerberus, the snarling three-headed watchdog of Hades, and bring him to Mycenae. Heracles searched far and wide till at last he found an entrance to the underworld near Helios's evening palace far to the west. Setting his face in a terrible scowl, he walked straight down to Hades. The fluttering souls trembled, and Hades himself was so frightened at the sight that he told him to take the dog, only please not to treat it too roughly. Cerberus growled and lashed out with his spiked tail, but Heracles threw his arms around him and squeezed him till the dog's three tongues hung out. Whining, Cerberus let Heracles drag him to the upper world and all the way to the gates of Mycenae. When Eurystheus saw the fearful hound, once again he dived into the urn and cowered there, not daring to make a sound. Heracles did not know what to do with the dog, so he dragged Cerberus all the way back down to Hades. Now Heracles was free. He had performed not only ten but twelve labors. He had atoned for his sins, and Zeus was very pleased with his strong son. He was pleased with Hera, too, for she had unknowingly helped Heracles win more glory and fame than any other hero on earth. Admired by everyone, Heracles traveled all over Greece, performing more heroic deeds and making many friends. But Hera, still relentless again, made him insane, and he swatted men down like flies. When he recovered his senses, he once more had to atone for his sins, and this time it was his father, Zeus, who meted out his punishment, seeing to it that there was no glory to be won. Zeus sentenced Heracles to serve for three years as the slave of Queen Omphale of Lydia. She dressed him in women's clothes and made the strongest man in the world sit at her feet, spinning and sewing with his huge hands, while she herself donned his lion skin and brandished his club. Heracles grumbled and groaned, but he did as he was ordered. When his three years at last were over, he had learned his lesson of humility. Again he performed heroic deeds and his friends were glad to see him back. One of his great friends was Admetus, king of Thessaly, under whom Apollo once had served when he was a slave on earth. To thank Admetus for his kindness, Apollo had persuaded the fates not to cut his thread of life when his time to die had come, as long as Admetus could find someone else willing to die in his steed. That would be easy, thought the king. His faithful men were always saying that his life was dearer to them than their own. King Admetus had always been afraid of dying early, for he was very happy with his beautiful queen, Alcestis. 
The king and the queen were both fond of Heracles and always welcomed him warmly. But one day when Heracles came to the palace, King Admetus greeted him alone. He looked sad and downcast. When Heracles asked him what was wrong, he said nothing except that a woman of the household had died and he must go to her funeral. And he left Heracles alone with the servants. They too looked sad. They waited on him in silence and did not answer his questions. Heracles ate, drank, and made merry alone, and at last he grew impatient, grasped one of the servants, and forced him to speak. The servant told him that the time had come for Admetus to die, and he had turned to his men and asked one of them to die in his steed. But now not one of them had been willing. Admetus then went to his parents, who were old and weary of life, and asked them to die in his steed. They too refused. But when he returned to his palace, he found Queen Alcestis setting off for the realm of the dead. She loved him so much, she said, she would gladly give her life for him, and the king was so fond of his own life that he let his queen depart. Now the king and all the household were mourning for Alcestis. Heracles shed big tears when he heard the sad story, but being a man of action, he seized his club and strode off to the underworld to force Hades to give Alcestis back. Such a loving wife should not be allowed to die. Heracles did not have to use his club. Cerberus slunk out of the way as he stormed into the palace of Hades. The Lord of the Dead himself had a cold, unloving queen, and he was so moved when Heracles told him of Alcestis's devotion that he let her go. Heracles brought Queen Alcestis back to King Admetus, and the grief in the palace changed to great joy. Now they all ate, drank, and made merry together, and Alcestis grew famous far and wide as the most devoted wife who ever lived. Heracles, too, wanted a wife, and he chose Daenerya, a Caledonian princess, for his bride. Daenerya had already been promised to the river god Achelous, but she dreaded the thought of being married to a river god who could change his shape at will. She would never know in which shape her husband would come home at night. She would rather marry the great hero Heracles. The two suitors agreed to wrestle, the victor to have the princess Daenerya. Of course Heracles won. The river god rushed at him in the shape of a bull, and Heracles seized him by a horn, wrenched it off, and threw him to the ground before he had time to change into something else. So Heracles and Daenerya were married and were very happy together. One day, as they were out traveling, they came to a swollen stream. Heracles forded it with ease, but Daenerya was afraid and stood on the bank. Along came the centaur Nessus and politely offered to carry her across. But Nessus, like all centaurs, was fond of pretty girls, and before he had reached midstream, he had made up his mind to carry her off. Once on the other side, he galloped off with her. Daenerya screamed for help. Heracles shot a poisoned arrow at the centaur, and Nessus fell to the ground. Before he died, he whispered to Daenerya, Take some of my blood and save it. If you ever fear that you are losing your husband's love, paint some of the blood on his tunic, and he will love you again. Daenerya carefully saved the drops of blood, for she knew well that many a girl would like to steal her magnificent husband. One day as Heracles was away at war, he won a great victory and sent a messenger home for his best tunic. He wanted to celebrate with his men, but Daenerya thought he wanted to make himself handsome for a girl. She painted some of Nessus's blood on the tunic. As soon as Heracles put it on, he felt as though a thousand fires were burning him. It was not a love potion that Nessus had given Daenerya, but the deadly poison of the Hydra from Heracles's arrow, mixed with Nessus's blood. Heracles was so strong that the poison could not kill him, but his sufferings were unbearable. He ordered his men to build a funeral pyre, spread his lion skin over the top, and lay down on it. Then he gave his bow and deadly arrows to his young friend Philoctetes as a parting gift. As the flames rose around him, a loud thunderclap was heard and Heracles, by the order of Zeus, rose up to Olympus, reclining on his lion skin. The gods all welcomed Heracles and were glad to have him with them, for the fates had predicted that Olympus would be attacked by a fearful enemy, and the Olympians could be saved only if the strongest man ever born fought on their side. The prediction soon came to pass. In a last effort to defeat the mighty thunder god Zeus, Mother Earth had given birth to fifty snake-like giants who surrounded Olympus and tried to storm the palace. They seemed unconquerable, for, like Antaeus, whom Heracles had fought on earth, they sprang up again revived as soon as they touched Mother Earth. Heracles knew what to do, and with his help the gods went over the giants and cast them down into the dismal pit of Tartarus. 
Heracles was now the hero of Mount Olympus, beloved by all the gods. Even Hera begged him to forgive her and gave him her daughter Hebe, goddess of eternal youth, for his Olympian bride. From then on, Hercules lived in eternal bliss, forever a joy to the gods. His father Zeus was very pleased. Theseus The Muses sang of Heracles and his labors, and they also sang of the island of Crete, ruled by King Minos, the son of Zeus and Europa. His queen, Pasiphae, a daughter of the sun god Helios, had a golden glimmer in her eyes like all the descendants of the sun and was accustomed to great magnificence. King Minos wanted his queen to live in a palace as splendid as her father's, and he ordered Daedalus, an Athenian architect and inventor of marvelous skill, to build the great palace of Knossos. The palace rose up story upon story over a forest of columns. Winding stairs and intricate passageways connected the many halls and courtyards. Pictures were painted on the walls of the great halls, fountains splashed in the courtyards, and the bathrooms even had running water. Bulls' horns of the purest gold crowned the roofs, for the Cretans worshipped the bull, since Zeus, in the shape of a bull, had brought Europa to the island. Here the king and the queen and all their court lived in great splendor and happiness until one day Poseidon sent a snow-white bull from the sea. Since the island of Crete was completely surrounded by his domain, the sea, he too wanted to be honored and ordered King Minos to sacrifice the bull to him. But Queen Pasiphae was so taken by the beauty of the white bull that she persuaded the king to let it live. She admired the bull so much that she ordered Daedalus to construct a hollow wooden cow so she could hide inside it and enjoy the beauty of the bull at close range. Poseidon was very angry, and for punishment he made the bull mad. It ravaged the whole island, and though the Cretans were great bullfighters, no one could have subdued the beast until Heracles had come to capture it for one of his labors. To punish the king and queen, Poseidon caused Pasiphae to give birth to a monster, the Minotaur. He was half man, half bull, and ate nothing but human flesh. Such a fearful monster could not go free, and the clever Daedalus constructed for him a labyrinth under the palace. It was a maze of passageways and little rooms from which nobody could ever hope to find his way out. There the Minotaur was shut in, and as long as he was provided with victims to devour, he kept quiet. When he was hungry, he bellowed so loudly that the whole palace shook. King Minos had to wage war with the neighboring island so he could supply the Minotaur with the prisoners of war for food. When a son of Minos visited Athens and was accidentally killed, King Minos used this as an excuse to threaten to sack the city unless seven Athenian maidens and seven Athenian youths were sent to Crete to be sacrificed to the Minotaur every nine years. To save his city, Aegis, the king of Athens, had to consent for Minos was much stronger than he. The people of Athens grumbled, for while King Aegis was childless and had nothing to lose, they had to see their sons and daughters sacrificed to the cruel Minotaur. Two times nine years had passed and the king was growing old. For the third time, a ship with black sails of mourning was due to depart. When word came to the king that a young hero, Theseus, from treason, was making his way to Athens, destroying all the monsters and highwaymen he met on the road. When King Aegis heard that, his old heart beat faster. Once in his youth, he had visited treason and had been secretly married to Princess Ethra. He did not bring Ethra back to Athens with him, but before he left, he said to her, should you bear me a son, and should he grow up strong enough to lift this boulder under which I hide my sword and golden sandals, send him to me, for then he will be the worthy heir to the throne of Athens. King Aegis in those days was known for his great strength. Theseus, the young hero, arrived in Athens and went straight to the king's palace. Tall and handsome, he stood before Aegis with the sandals and the sword, and the king was overjoyed. At last he had a son, who was a hero, as well. The king happily proclaimed Theseus the rightful heir to the throne of Athens, and he became the hero of all Athens when he offered to take the place of one of the victims who were to be sent to Crete. Old King Aegis begged his son not to go, but Theseus would not change his mind. I shall make an end of the Minotaur and we shall return safely, he said. We sail with black sails, but we shall return with white sails as a signal of my success. The ship sailed to Crete, and the fourteen young Athenians were locked in a dungeon to await their doom. But King Minos had a lovely daughter, Ariadne, as fair a maiden as eyes could see. She could not bear the thought that handsome Theseus should be sacrificed to the ugly Minotaur. She went to Daedalus and begged for help to save him. 
he gave ariadne a magic ball of thread and told her that at midnight when the minotaur was fast asleep she must take theseus to the labyrinth the magic ball of thread would roll ahead of him through the maze and lead him to the monster and then it was up to theseus to overpower the beast in the dark of the night ariadne went to theseus's prison and whispered that if he would promise to marry her and carry her away with him she would help him gladly theseus gave his word and ariadne led him to the gate of the labyrinth tied the end of the thread to the gate so he would find his way back and gave him the ball as soon as theseus put the ball of thread on the ground it rolled ahead of him through the dark corridors upstairs downstairs and around winding passageways holding on to the unwinding thread theseus followed it wherever it led him and before long he heard the thunderous snoring of the minotaur and there surrounded by skulls and bleached bones lay the monster fast asleep theseus sprang at the minotaur it roared so loudly that the whole palace of Knossos shook but the monster was taken by surprise and so strong was theseus that with his bare hands he killed the cruel minotaur theseus quickly followed the thread back to ariadne who stood watch at the gate together they freed the other athenians and ran to their ship in the harbor before they sailed they bored holes in all of king minos's ships so he could not pursue them ariadne urged them to hurry for even she could not save them from talos the bronze robot who guarded the island if he should see their ship leaving he would throw rocks at it and sink it should one of them manage to swim ashore talos would throw himself into a blazing bonfire until he was red hot then he would burn the survivor to ashes in a fiery embrace they could already hear his clanking steps when just in time they hoisted their sail and a brisk wind blew them out to sea in their rush they forgot to hoist the white sail of victory instead of the black sail of mourning theseus's heart was filled with joy not only had he saved the athenians from the minotaur he was also bringing a beautiful bride home to athens but in the middle of the night the god dionysus appeared to him and spoke i forbid you to marry ariadne i myself had chosen her for my bride you must set her ashore on the island of naxus theseus could not oppose an olympian god when they came to naxus he ordered everyone to go ashore and rest there ariadne fell into a heavy slumber and while she slept theseus led the others back to the ship and they sailed off without her poor ariadne wept bitterly when she awoke and found herself deserted little did she suspect that the handsome stranger who came walking toward her was the god dionysus and that it was he who had ordered theseus to abandon her the god gently dried her tears and gave her a drink from the cup in his hand and right away the sadness left her she smiled up at the god and he put a crown of sparkling jewels on her head and made her his bride they lived happily together for many years and their sons became kings of the surrounding islands dionysus loved ariadne greatly and when she died he put her jeweled crown into the sky as a constellation so she would never be forgotten theseus in his grief at having lost ariadne again forgot to hoist the white sail when king aegis saw the black sailed ship returning from crete he threw himself into the sea in despair Theseus inherited his father's throne, and he and all of Athens mourned the loss of the old king, and in his honor named the sea in which he had drowned the Aegean. King Minos was beside himself with fear when he discovered that his daughter had fled with the Athenians. He knew that no one but the brilliant Daedalus could have helped Theseus unravel the mystery of the labyrinth, so Daedalus was kept a prisoner in the palace and treated very harshly. Daedalus could not bear to be locked up and let his talents go to waste. Secretly he made two sets of wings, one pair for himself and one pair for his son, Icarus. They were cleverly fashioned of feathers set in beeswax. He showed his son how to use them and warned him not to fly too high or the heat of the sun would melt the wax. Then he led him up to the highest tower, and flapping their wings, they flew off like two birds. Neither King Minos nor Talos the robot could stop their flight. Young and foolish, Icarus could not resist the temptation to rise ever higher into the sky. The whole world seemed at his feet. He flew too close to the sun and the wax began to melt. The feathers came loose, the wings fell apart, and Icarus plunged into the sea and drowned. Sadly, Daedalus flew on alone and came to the island of Sicily. His fame had flown ahead of him, and the king of Sicily welcomed him warmly, for he too wanted a splendid palace and bathrooms with running water. As soon as King Minos's ships were mended, he set off in pursuit of Daedalus, the cunning craftsman. He sailed east and he sailed west, and when he came to the Sicilian shore and saw the wondrous palace going up, he had no doubts who was building it. But the king of Sicily hid Daedalus and denied that he had him in his service. Slyly, King Minos sent a conch shell up to the palace with a message that, if anyone could pull a thread through the windings of the conch, he would give him a sack of gold as a reward. The king of Sicily asked Daedalus to solve the problem. 
Daedalus thought for a while. Then he tied a silken thread to an ant, put the ant at one end of the conch shell and a bit of honey at the other end. The ant smelled the honey and found its way through the conch, pulling the thread along with it. When King Minos saw this, he demanded the immediate surrender of Daedalus, for now he had proof that the king of Sicily was hiding him. Nobody but Daedalus could have threaded the conch. The king of Sicily had to give in. He invited Minos to a feast, promising to surrender Daedalus. As was the custom, King Minos took a bath before the feast. But when he stepped into the fabulous bath that Daedalus had built, boiling water rushed out of the tap and scalded him to death. And Daedalus remained for the rest of his life at the court of the king of Sicily. After the death of King Minos, there was peace between Crete and Athens, and Theseus married Phaedra, Ariadne's younger sister. He became the greatest king Athens ever had, and his fame as a hero spread all over Greece. Another great hero, Pyrethuus, king of the Lapith people in northern Greece, was his inseparable friend. The first time the two heroes had met, they faced each other in combat, but each was so impressed by the other that instead of fighting, they dropped their weapons and swore eternal friendship. Together they performed many great deeds, and when Pyrethuus married a Lapith princess, Theseus, of course, was invited to the wedding feast. The centaurs were invited too, for though wild and lawless, they were nonetheless distant relatives. At first they behaved quite mannerly, but as the wine jugs were passed around, they became boisterous and rowdy. Suddenly a young centaur sprang up, grasped the bride by the hair, and galloped away with her. At that, the other centaurs each grasped a screaming girl and took to the hills. Theseus and Pyrethuus, with their men set off in swift pursuit, and soon caught up with the centaurs. There was a brutal battle, for the wild centaurs tore up big trees and swung them as clubs. But in Theseus and... Pyrethuus, they had found their masters. They were chased out of Greece, and their victorious heroes, with the bride and the other Lapith girls, returned to the feast. Pyrethuus lived happily for a while, then he became a widower and asked his friend Theseus to help him win a new bride. Theseus vowed to help him, but shuddered when he heard that Pyrethuus wanted no one less than Persephone, the queen of the dead. She was unhappy with Hades, he said. Since Theseus had promised to help his friend, and a promise could not be broken, he descended to the underworld with Pyrethuus. They forced their way past Cerberus and entered the gloomy palace. Hades glowered at the two heroes who had dared to enter his realm, but he listened politely while they stated their errand. Sit down on that bench, he said, so we can discuss the matter. Grim Hades smiled as the two friends sat down, for it was a magic bench from which no one could ever rise. There they were to sit forever with ghosts and bats flitting about their heads. A long time later, Heracles came to Hades on an errand and pitied the two heroes trying vainly to get up from the bench. He took hold of Theseus and tore him loose with a mighty tub. But when he tried to free Pyrethuus, there came a loud earthquake. The gods did not allow Heracles to set him free, for he had shown too great irreverence by daring to want a goddess for a wife. Theseus returned to Athens, wiser but thinner, for a part of him had remained stuck to the bench ever since the Athenians have had lean thighs.